very much. Um, it's great to join CPG in East West. Um, I've had the privilege of uh, living in most of the countries in South Asia um, and also doing business in South Asia. So having a good understanding of um, each of the, the countries, the policies, the politics, um, it, it's really interesting to hear uh, different um, feedback from uh, the panel here today. Uh, but most interesting for me is, you know, COVID is, uh, has only been with us for the last six months or maybe a little bit longer in certain countries. But these issues in, in SAC has been there for decades and hasn't gone away. So as much as we need to fix the COVID problem, we do need to fix um, other issues around that. So let me start with the, uh, the COVID issue itself. So when you look at um, all of the crashes that have happened globally, uh, when you look at the dot-com crash, um, the economy um, still grew in South Asia by about 4.5%. Then you look at the global financial crisis in uh, 2010, 2009-2010, uh, the South Asia region still grew at 4%. Um, then you look at um, you know, the euro crisis uh, around that same time up in 2012, uh, you still see you know, South Asia still had a, a good uh, GDP growth of 5%. And again, during COVID, it's got a GDP growth of about 2.6%. So when you look at all of this comparing to, you know, the, the developed countries um, like North America, Europe, and Japan, uh, we are much better from an economic point of view. Um, there are obviously health risks and uh, the things that we need to address in our health system. But economically, um, from a GDP growth point of view, we're in a much better place than uh, most of the rest of the world. So we should be happy about it. Um, the second thing is, I think overall in South Asia, we're very resilient. And uh, we are a resilient bunch who get back on, on their feet. Um, and our requirement to get back on our feet is very less than the rest of the world. So we will bounce back a lot faster than most places as well. I look at a country like Sri Lanka, uh, you know, we've had a a uh, double whammy in a year. Uh, we had the Easter bombings last year, and then we uh, had COVID this year. So our, you know, when you look at a financial year of our business, um, we've had double whammy in that same year. So how we look at things is, you know, we, we look at things positively and we look at things as opportunities of uh, how we can actually help each other in this region. One of the critical things that I've seen uh, in my times in most of these countries is that we are battling for the same business. Um, when we look at um, the exports that we do from the region, we're looking at some things like the textiles and apparel. Every single one of the countries in this region is big in textile and apparel. Uh, the second one is look at IT. Um, you know, we're very big in IT as well uh, in, in throughout the region and other parts of the region are getting stronger as well. So we're fighting for the same tie uh, from the rest of the world. Um, and that's what sort of baffles me sometimes that, you know, we live in a, uh, you know, a radius where well, possibly there's about 3 billion people, um, uh, 3 billion people living in the region. So why aren't we doing more business in this region? We've got a very young population, 70% of this regional population uh, is in, in a, you know, less than 35. Uh, we've got growth um, rates that are much higher than the rest of the world. Um, and secondly, uh, and, and lastly, I would say is that, you know, the global center of gravity, uh, when you look at where the global center of gravity was in 1820, it was just where close to India, China uh, border. But, you know, over the years up to 1950, just floated towards the US. And again, it's floating back. And, you know, if everything goes right, by 2025, 2026, this region's uh, center of gravity for, um, uh, a center of gravity for uh, wealth will come back into this region. So wealth recognition in this region is uh, increasing at a high rate as well. And I think we need to be cognizant of that. When you talk to most businesses in South Asia, they love to um, export to the European Union or export to the US. Uh, nobody talks about, oh, I'm a, you know, the first thing anybody says is I export to these countries, but nobody says I export to India or I export to Pakistan or I export to Thailand. Those are what um, the revenues that come in. And when you look at the exports of these countries, uh, the number ones are US and then Europe. 
then you uh, have other countries like the UAE uh, as being third. So there is a disparity in the way that um, uh, the overall trade happens uh, within this region. And I think there's opportunity for us to really work on that. If I hear one more uh, committee or one more organization that's doing a study on what exactly needs to be done, we've got enough agreements in place. We've got SARC, we've got SAFTA, we've got the Bay of Bengal, we've got SEPA, and I can go on. I've got a whole list of agreements that has been signed and nothing has been executed uh, for trade. Um, and it's really frustrating for business people like us when uh, things are, opportunities are not taken by a lot of these regional companies and, and countries. And um, the main reason for that is the paperwork attached to doing all of this. The cumbersome paperwork is one of the biggest reasons that trade is not taking place within this region. Um, I think if I just break it down to one, is the trade agreements, are they in place? Most of the trade agreements are, are in place. Is SARC ever going to work? I don't think as, uh, as much as we would love it to work. As, as long as we have India and Pakistan at loggerheads, it's never going to work. And it actually affects smaller countries like Sri Lanka even more than countries like Pakistan or, or, or India. Um, and I think that's something that we need to figure out how to fix that. I was really hopeful when all of the regional leaders got together uh, on one um, Zoom call to discuss and you know, uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Jagannath said, uh, they were looking at this fund to be created and I, I was really hopeful that that might be the start of uh, things to come but nothing has moved forward in the last three months since that call. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, when you look at um, the overall uh, agreement in SARC, I think uh, when you look at most of the countries around the world, you look at the US, uh, they're the leader in that region. Uh, when you look at Mexico, when you look at South America, all of them look to support um, the US economy. The US gives a lot of support to those countries as well. When you look at um, Europe, it's similar with the UK, um, uh, with uh, uh, Germany, and also with um, France, they've supported the, the regions there. And then you look at China and how they've supported Malaysia, Philippines, um, Myanmar, et cetera, and, and develop. But India has not taken that leadership role in this region. And we haven't had one organization or a country that's really driven uh, from that leadership approach in here in investing time uh, and effort in building um, the uh, required infrastructure, required agreements, the required trade, and most importantly, the required investment. So when China comes in and invests in Pakistan, it invests in uh, Sri Lanka, they are helping the economy grow. And I am very positive. I think the Belt and Road um, strategy is, is brilliant. If everybody sees that positively, it can actually impact uh, cheaper goods to the rest of the world. And it can also impact cheaper goods to our own individual country. So I think, you know, we need to, as much as we would love to, uh, you know, a lot of people hate uh, how China does business, but I'm actually a fan of how they're actually helping some of these economies grow and, and bringing in money for investments, which other countries just sit around the table and talk about. Um, from an economic, uh, economy point of view, I think um, the overall leverage of most of these countries is a big concern. Um, especially uh, countries like uh, Sri Lanka and, and Pakistan. Uh, but I think I'm hopeful that the, the world will look at uh, the, the new world coming out of South Asia and uh, investing in here. It was good to see Google having a focus on investing in, in this region, Facebook and um, uh, other companies looking at investing in this region. And, and I, hopefully that will help us alleviate some of the pressures on some of this debt that's been created in the region as well. We have tourism as, as a real big opportunity, which in the economy side, obviously at this moment is not the best, but some of the best places in the world and some of the most untouched places in the world uh, are in Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and India, and even Bhutan. Um, and you know we just don't do enough for tourism and continue to drive that touristic approach. And also uh, the training that's required, it's not just the tourism, we can, we can be charging higher prices, we can be entertaining differently. Uh, when you go into the places like Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, 
where they really have got tourism to a real next level of uh, service. Um, and finally, when you look at um, in, my, in, in what I think is one of the critical things that uh, I spoke about was infrastructure development and uh, the ports in Gawad and Hambantota um, are really helpful in, in trade in this region and it can also be um, a, a hub and spoke model for this region. So uh, potentially it could be regional warehouses uh, for export into Thailand, Myanmar, etc. Um, and also it will help in reducing transport costs. Uh, one of the critical things that we do need to address is the energy cost. The energy cost in South Asia is still higher compared to the rest of the world. And the only way of addressing it is through solar and wind. And we have plenty of solar and wind in this region to be able to do that. So as long as we have a policy, um, and I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Santos talked about, you know, carbon credits, et cetera, and look at focusing on how do we eliminate um, uh, and control CO2, emissions uh, through more re renewable energy investments, I think that'll be a great opportunity as well. Um, and, and one final remark on infrastructure is I think the, the regional supply chain uh, is very important. I think uh, the global supply chain broke down during COVID. There were lessons learned um, and there is also country lessons learned as well. So there's a real driven focus in Sri Lanka of being self-sufficient, looking at agriculture, Whatever we can grow here, why should we be importing it in? And helping that whole trade deficit uh, by doing that. So I think these are just some of my thoughts, but I think the trade agreements, uh, the economy and the infrastructure are gonna be critical in, in setting uh, a business as correct in this region. Otherwise, you know, you look at the trade between uh, India and, and this region, trade between China and this region, India's trade has been anything between 1.7 to 3% over the last 10 years in this region. China's trade has been over 400% and they've gone from $8 billion to $52 billion in that same period. So I think there is opportunity for the regional trade to improve. Thank you, Farwa.